time once again for Community Forum, and we are very lucky to have with us live in the studios Dr. Jim Demain. Dr. Jim Demain is a pulmonary and critical care physician who retired from active practice at Group Health in 2003. He is an emeritus clinical professor of medicine at the University of Washington, and he presents talks locally about end-of-life issues and blogs at endoflifeblog.com. Jim, thank you very much for coming and spending time with us this morning. Thank you. So start out, tell us, uh, how did you transition from uh, doing pulmonary and critical care uh, at uh, Group Health into now focusing on end-of-life issues? Well, it actually started, Mike, when I was in medical practice. Intensive care units uh, developed actually during the 1960s, 1970s, and uh, I gradually... Uh, that became part of my medical practice was to work in critical care. And then it became a standalone specialty in uh, the uh, late 80s. But uh, while I would be caring for patients in the intensive care, it wasn't uncommon to have somebody quite ill on a respirator, unable to communicate with us for a variety of reasons, and we would be making decisions about their further care with the family. And quite often, unfortunately, the individuals had never had a discussion with their loved ones about what their wishes might be. And sometimes it was quite a struggle. The, the patient might have had a stroke or the organs were failing, and we just didn't know whether we were prolonging the patient's death or whether we were really... Uh, carrying out their wishes by applying all the technology we have. So because of this, I became interested in uh, earlier education, if you will, of introducing families to uh, having these discussions and um, understanding what high technology can offer. You know, if we go see a surgeon and we're going to have an operation, they'll inform us what the benefits are of that operation and what the downside is. But we don't really get told much about the type of technologies we have in the ICU. For example, what is the benefit of CPR in various age groups? What, when I go on a ventilator, what are my chances of coming off? And do I have a right to decline certain treatments like tube feeding or even intravenous fluid therapy. I can give you an example. You know, when my dad was 94, uh, he had been slipping in his health for many years, was in a, um, assisted care for a while, and then eventually uh, in a more full nursing care because he needed a lot of assistance. His mind was still relatively clear a little bit confused at times, but he had been pretty clear that he didn't want uh, life-sustaining treatment. So it was um, when he finally, uh, well, I got a call uh, from my sister. This was, she, he was out in Western Pennsylvania. And my sister said, Dad isn't eating. And I said, well, you know, sometimes that happens when you're 94. Uh, but technology stepped in and uh, the doctor ordered a full body CAT scan, uh, which I didn't think was necessary at all. But they found a little one centimeter spot on one of his kidneys. And my sister said, shouldn't it be biopsied? And I said, well, gosh, no, because dad's 94. If it is a tiny cancer, it couldn't possibly be making him stop eating. Um, so they went on just with supportive care, and then he quit drinking. Uh, one of the family members said that we should start intravenous fluid therapy, but Dad didn't want that. So uh, if we'd done that, then, then we would have had to think about other nutrition, like a feeding tube. And at 94, with somebody that was simply slipping away from old age, this didn't seem to be the right thing to do. So we, we let him go, and I had what's called the durable power of attorney for health care, and that allowed me to tell the other family member who disagreed with this that 
you know, we're just carrying out dad's wishes. It's not my wish or your wish, but our responsibility is to carry out dad's wish. So when I talk to groups, I tell them that if they are going to have, uh, first of all, try to have the conversations with your loved ones. And this is a very difficult kind of thing to do. Uh, you know, some families just don't discuss those kind of things. But uh, there are little uh, cues and tips that you can use to begin to have those conversations. For example, saying, you know, our friend, Mr. So-and-so, when he died, how do you think the family handled it? So you can kind of depersonalize it and talk about somebody else. But there are value sheets. Uh, there are starter kits. If you're going to go on the web and look for a good site about having discussions with your family, Ellen Goodman's website called The Conversation Project uh, is one I think that uh, is right up there on my list of uh, things to look at and uh, help you to have those discussions. Her mother was very ill and had, I'm sure, what she would call a, a bad death. And uh, so Ellen Goodman, with the support of a lot of people in the field, has put together this website. So that's where I started to have these conversations was in the intensive care unit. But since that time, uh, Group Health developed a program called Your Life, Your Choices. And everybody at age 65 is offered a chance to come to one of these classes where we have a good, rich discussion uh, about this. And um, that's a way to, to start. And then I've given these talks in, in faith groups and rotaries and even once at the Seattle Tennis Club. So people are interested now. Um, and the, the D word used to be uh, unspoken in families, but now I think as a society, there's a lot of books being published uh, about the subject. Um, and I think the American public is more willing to think about and talk about, and we need to because we have an aging society. Uh, so that's, that's kind of where I got going. Well, and it would seem to be something that would apply to more than those uh, folks who are getting up in their years. Um, obviously, if you have parents, I mean, I, I became of this these issue became aware of these issues, you know, from dealing with my own mom's passing, and a lot of it was you know steep learning curve ahead. Um, but it would seem to be issues that we should all be examining for ourselves as well, because you never know when you're going to like come down with something and you know, look at who's going to be making the, the, the decisions if uh, you haven't already made plans to have someone in charge. So um, yeah, that's so true. You know, when we're young, we kind of think we're immortal and, and we kind of understand death is out there, but we tend to depersonalize it uh, and trying to make uh, advanced directives when you're young isn't a common thing to do. But I actually think uh, filling out advanced directives is for everyone, not not just for the elderly. Um, although people still don't do it, um, I gave this talk, uh, uh, your life, your choices talk, to UW law students on two occasions, and they were blogging and arguing and writing about uh, Nancy Cruzan case, who which was a young woman in a severe uh, isolated traffic accident where her car went off the road and she wasn't found a very late. And she ended up being in a vegetative state, uh, prolonged without any chance of neurologic recovery, much like Terry Schiavo. And she had a feeding tube. And uh, the, but she didn't have any advanced directive or type of conversation that anybody could recall. So nobody knew what her wishes were, whether to be kept alive or not. So the argument was whether uh, we, we can remove the feeding tube. I think the family wanted to remove it, and the hospital said, no, this is killing somebody. So it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and uh, the uh, decision was that if, if, if it uh, is deemed to be in the patient's best interest uh, by her loved ones, 
and it's permissible to remove a feeding tube and allow somebody to die. So anyway, they were arguing about the individual rights in this issue, but, and I asked them, do any of you um, who are studying to be attorneys uh, have advanced directives for yourself? And none of them had. So it, it, it's something that we're in denial most of our lives, but I think at some point, and it's better too early than too late, is to have these discussions because we never know when we're going to wind up um, being kept alive maybe a lot longer. And, you know, families don't want to lose their parents, their loved ones, their their spouses, their their siblings. So families sometimes tend to hang on a lot longer. And this is one of the common problems in the intensive care unit. Mom or dad may be ready to go, but the family, for whatever reason, isn't ready to let them go. And um, trying to respect the wishes of the individual when we don't know, there's been no advanced planning or conversations, then we're kind of stuck. All right. So define what uh, advanced directives are and how one goes about that. Well, you can download Washington State Advanced Directives uh, just by Googling that and then downloading. There's two basic forms. One is called the Living Will, which is a uh, form that you can sign. Uh, and it, it says if two physicians deem that I'm terminal uh, within six months, uh, that I would not want uh, CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, and also there's check boxes on that to say whether you want a uh, feeding tube or fluids. It's, it's a form really of values or wishes. It's not very complete. I think uh, End of Life Washington, uh, which used to be Compassion and Choices, has a more complete form. That can also be downloaded from End of Life Washington. The second form, and actually these Two ought to be one together as they are with the end of life Washington. But the second form, and probably the most important one to fill out, is your durable power of attorney for health care. This, in this form, uh, you assign an individual and an alternate or a second alternate to be the one that can make health decisions when you can't make them for yourself. And this um, uh, form then uh, allows you to uh, have those conversations for the person. The individual you select really needs to be a very strong advocate, somebody that can stand up to the healthcare team, to other family members, somebody close to your heart that really understands your wishes and uh, could speak for you. And this is a difficult role, uh, but uh, Sometimes it isn't a family member you appoint. Sometimes it will be a close friend or other advocate uh, that you can find. But that, that is the, the key person. There is a third form, which is not really an advanced directive, but it's a standing set of medical orders. Uh, this is called the POLST form, P-O-L-S-T, Physician Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. This is a bright green form uh, that can be easily found by medics. Uh, it's signed both by you, the patient, and the physician, uh, PA or nurse uh, practitioner. And this form is actual standing medical orders. Uh, there are various check boxes on it, whether you would or would not want CPR, whether you would or would not want a ventilator, whether you would want uh, uh, limited medical care, which might be IVs or antibiotics, or whether you would only want comfort care. You don't want any intervention except really good palliative care for comfort to relieve suffering. And this form is most commonly used for people who are within their last year of life. But there's some frail elderly that are up in their 80s or 90s that may not be terminal in the sense of being expected to die within six months, but they're really sure that they don't want CPR or high tech. They've lived a full life. They just want to die at home with loved ones around in a peaceful atmosphere. Uh, and that is doable these days. But uh, the forms help. Uh, but one of the 
problems when we're admitted to a hospital now, we're really cared for by strangers. Uh, we have hospitalists, we have <clears throat> intensive care specialists, but they don't really know us. So having the advocate there, your durable power of attorney is, is so important. Now, the pulsed form, again, that's something we used with my mother. Um, it's, it's something that you post, or at least she posted. We posted it like right there in uh, her bedroom. So if uh, medical people were arrived via a 911 call, um, they would immediately be able to see that and you know follow its orders. But how do people get that out um, if you know they don't want to prominently display it in their home and and or uh, it's something that you're doing now because in anticipation that you might need it years down the road? Yeah, with the Pulse form, uh, we haven't quite figured that out in this state, how to deal with that. For, generally, uh, it's not a problem because uh, the person that's filled it out is not uh, out and about that much. Uh, they're on hospice. And it is bright green. It's at the foot of the bed or on the refrigerator, prominently displayed somewhere in the home so the medics can find it if 911 gets called. Um, where I live, uh, it's a, a senior high-rise type uh, independent living. Uh, we've encouraged frail elderly who want to fill out a pulse form to go ahead and do it. Um, but you're right, people don't want to store it so, <laughs> you know, display it so all their company can see what their wishes are. So we have a standardized uh, hanging file that we put on the inside of the kitchen cabinet door under the sink. And so the medics no, it's a standard policy for the building. So if they come in, they'll be able to find the pulse form. Some women uh, that are out and about will copy, uh, take a copy, which is valid, and put it in their purse. Uh, some people have a little shrunken green tab that they carry with them that says where my pulse form is. Um, in California, Wisconsin, and some other states, they uh, have standardized bracelet, bracelets or medallions that people can wear with a big uh, uh, seal on it. And it, it says DNR, which means do not resuscitate. And uh, they can wear it as a bracelet or a medallion necklace if they want, or even some women will attach it to their purse. And uh, this will give your name, uh, emergency numbers, and also state where you're, it will say, DNR pulse form and give a, a number where that can be retrieved. In Oregon, they actually have a statewide registry for pulse forms, which I think is an excellent idea. Washington had uh, attempts at one for a while that was tax funded, but that tax money was pulled. So we don't really have a statewide registry now. We mentioned earlier CPR and just mentioned um, DNR, do not resuscitate. Um, I was actually shocked to find out about a year ago how ineffective CPR is in terms of its success rate. You know, we're all, at least I was raised to believe. I learned CPR early on. I took, you know, lifeguard training early on, you know, and you have this image from television that, boy, you know, your chances are reasonable when you use CPR that it's going to work. But it turns out the, the real stats are something completely different. Yeah, the CPR uh, in Seattle is probably as good as it gets anywhere in the world. Uh, Morley Safer came out here in the 60s to ride with Medic One, and he's famously quoted saying that Seattle's the best place to have a heart attack. And if you're, let's say, 60-year-old and you have a heart attack and go down uh, and somebody does start CPR, uh, we have wonderful training in the community by Medic Two that will go out and give classes. Uh, and I would encourage anybody that hasn't done it to do it. It may be so useful for your own family members uh, and when you're out in the community. But um, if you go down, let's say, and you're a basically healthy person with a heart attack uh, and they find a shockable rhythm, in other words, you have a dynamic rhythm, electrical rhythm that can be shocked with an AED device, which are commonly available in public places now, or Medic One gets there and they have their defibrillator. They, they now use techniques of cooling down the body as they take you in to lower your metabolism, try to protect your brain. 
And uh, with a shockable rhythm now, uh, surprising Seattle statistics are like 55% survival for that group. However, if you look at overall, it's, it's around uh, somewhere between 5 and 15% uh, survival to hospital discharge. So you, your chances generally are, are 1 in 10 or so of, of making it through. Now, if you look on television, it's about overall 66% survival. So, yeah, we have some unrealistic expectations, but it really can be dramatic. Uh, even in your 70s and 80s and even into their 90s, uh, if you're basically non-terminal, 90-year-old, uh, the latest published uh, data from Harborview uh, is like 4%, 4.7% survival to discharge from a hospital. So even in your 80s or 90s, it's not zero. But a lot of people say, hey, I'm 90 years old. I don't want somebody uh, pushing on my chest. I know they're going to break my ribs. I know I'm going to be terribly uncomfortable. I know my chances of survival are poor. I could have uh, neurologic damage. Uh, even though I get out of the hospital, I might wind up uh, permanently in a nursing home. So people don't want to take those chances. They say, hey, I've lived a full life. Let me go the old-fashioned way, the, the natural way. I mean, we didn't even have CPR until it was uh, invented in the 1960s. So we're, as a society, though, we're all signed up for CPR. Uh, we allow a stranger to come and push on our chest if we fall down. I mean, this is a, where there's good Samaritan laws to protect that. So if we don't want it, we do need those ways that we have been talking about to um, prevent the overuse of technology. You know, if you go into an emergency room or intensive care unit, the default is to do everything. I always say if you go into a barber shop, you're very likely to get a haircut. So, yeah, if you go into the, that's what they're trained to do. They're trained to save lives. And the, uh, so you have to say, okay, I don't want that. I, I can tell you a story about one patient I had that had very severe emphysema, lived out on Bashan Island. And he was a, a we kind of became friends over the years. And one day he said, Doc, I want to take you out to lunch. And I was a little surprised. I was afraid he was going to try to sell me something because he was a super sales kind of guy. But we did go out to lunch. He had very severe emphysema. He'd had a couple of hospitalizations in the past year, gasping, so short of breath, so uncomfortable each time. He got through. Uh, he wouldn't go live with his sons in Seattle. He, he didn't want anybody to live with him. Uh, he wanted to just have his symptoms taken care of at the end. He said, I just don't want to suffer. I'm like a fish out of water. I'm gasping. It's the most horrible thing. I want some help at the end. And I said, well, I'm not Dr. Kravorkian, and we're not allowed to do that kind of thing, but there are things we can do. I, I said, it's permissible for me to treat you with small doses of morphine to take away your symptoms. The intent is not to end your life, the intent is to aggressively treat your symptoms. And that's now what we call palliative care. And, and you can be pretty aggressive with palliative care. And it's acceptable in all the specialty medical societies. It, I, so if the intent is to relieve suffering, I said, well, we would make you with some morphine, take away your shortness of breath, give you euphoria, uh, give you a sense of comfort, peace, and, and make you sleepy. And he said, well, that's what I'd want. And I said, well, Talk this over with your family. Make sure that your sons are on board. And he did. Uh, called me back and said, yeah, they, they agree. That's what I would want. So I didn't hear much more from him. But a couple months later, I got a call from the emergency room saying that uh, Joe was there. So I, uh, they wanted to admit him to the intensive care unit. And I said, no, I don't think he w we want to do that. Let me come in and see him. So I did. He looked me in the eye and said, remember what we talked about? And I said, and I reviewed the plan of giving him a low dose morphine uh, with extra boluses as he needed it. I found a couple of really experienced nurses up in the medical unit. I did not put him in the intensive care unit. So we were able to titrate his symptoms, make him comfortable, and he died peacefully that night around 2.30 a.m. Uh, so he went the way he wanted. He was a good communicator. He was in charge. 
He, he made his wishes very clear, and uh, I was able to give him the support uh, of doing that. People ask me, wasn't that hard to do? Weren't, weren't you actually, uh, in a sense, killing him? And I said, no, we, we were allowing him to have a peaceful death. He was going to die anyway. And did you want it an ugly, gasping, horrible kind of death or one where he could be at peace? And the son sent me a, a beautiful letter later saying, you know, if dad could come back, he would shake your hand. So speaking of palliative care, can you talk a bit about, we've got just five minutes left, talk a bit about hospice and what people can um, expect from that? Sure. Uh, first of all, palliative care can be given at any age, hospice or not. Uh, it's a new medical specialty. There's actually boards in palliative care. But it's something that all physicians need to learn about, particularly internists, primary care, and others, as to how to aggressively treat symptoms. Uh, we're very disease-focused, but sometimes not enough symptom-focused. There's a wonderful palliative care center for excellence uh, run out of the University of Washington, Harborview. Randy Curtis, uh, a critical care physician, is in charge of that, and they've received some wonderful grants. So they are really training palliative care specialists and uh, studying the issues around uh, palliative care and end-of-life care. Hospice is a wonderful service uh, funded through Medicare and some insurance companies fund it. It's <clears throat> focused on pretty much a holistic approach to people at their end of lives. Uh, Medicare offers uh, medication, 24-7 nurse heart hotline, um, home visits, um, medications are covered, durable medical equipment is covered. Uh, they have volunteer spiritual care. So it's a, a, a wonderful service. Uh, it allows people to die in their own environment, most often home. If you, if you survey people, that's where they would like to die. Uh, a home or home-like environment where they can have their symptoms well controlled and have their loved ones around them. So we are, as a country, really good about use of hospice and getting better all the time. We, we still, people get into hospice a little bit late because they've been fighting, 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 and then switch over into hospice. I would like to see the Medicare rules eased up so that <clears throat> people are allowed to go into hospice while they're still receiving some chemo or other uh, attempts at therapy so they can transition more naturally into hospice care. And people can get uh, hospice care if the window of their expected <clears throat> passing is uh, estimated to be six months, is yeah. that correct? <clears throat> the, the Medicare rules are expected to die within six months. Uh, a lot of people are in hospice only three days, though. That's the, one of the big problems. Ironically, if somebody does get into hospice, they end up living longer than expected uh, because of the really good care they're getting. And some people will actually do so well, they'll leave hospice for a while, only to get back into it later. And if somebody goes seven or eight months, they're not kicked out of hospice. They, they can get an extension period. People feel that hospice is giving up, and I think that's why their reluctance to switch. It can be family members, patients, or physicians. I mean, some physicians are very reluctant to say, you know, I think it's time to start thinking about hospice. You know, what do you think about that? And, and some people think the doctor is giving up on them. I really dislike when physicians say there's nothing more we can do because there's always more caring, always more things you can do in terms of relieving symptoms, holding their hand, being with them, not giving up. If people feel their physicians are giving up, that's, that <clears throat> is such a negative statement. So I would hope my colleagues will always say, yeah, there, there's some more things we can do. We might not you know, cure your disease, but there are a lot of things we can do to make your life more comfortable. Yeah. I found hospice uh, a, a godsend when we were dealing with my mom. They were so helpful. So, um, and very frustrated that the federal government is, continues to cut back on support of hospice. So um, unfortunately we are out of time. A half hour flies by. 
Um, so I want to thank you very much for coming in, spending time with us this morning. And I believe most of the sites and everything you mentioned is uh, links to that are available at your blog. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Yep. All right. Well, thank you again for coming in and spending time with us this morning.